Bolden alive, <laughs> so I round the applause for that. Every time I go there, I think they're going to build a wicker man. <laughs> but, uh, but he's only got 20 minutes and he's, he's got to go. Uh, I love his books, he's got a new book out as well at the moment. Uh, please welcome uh, Lord Andrew Adonis. Only coherent explanation of the Irish backstop I have ever heard, and he, he was no doubt going on to explain what Canada plus 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 was as well. So you've got to understand the, this load of, of garbage that Theresa May is about to bring back from Brussels for the uh, to replace membership of the European Union is going to be Canada plus 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 with the backstop with the backstop the backstop which Michael was coming on to, which is a very very important part of it, which might be time limited, and which if you read the front page of the Times today. Prime Minister said that the government might not invoke anyway as a way of appeasing the DUP. So it's an, an inoperable backstop to a backstop, which is also time limited. <laughs> Do you know what I think is the right thing? Why don't we just stay in the European Union? <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to. Now, can I also say respect to Joe Johnson? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, uh, some of us can you see what the next Conservative leadership election is going to be. It puts the Miliband brothers to shame. What's going to happen next time? <laughs> That's all. Well, and we know, we know it, we, which, jo which Johnson we want. But why has Joe done it? Joe, I know Joe, because we're both former Financial Times journalists. We're both people in this very unfashionable these days. There are these things called facts. There's this thing, you know, we, the thing, the thing which we used to, we used to guide public policy when we did it. There's this thing called the national economic interest. Do you remember that? There was this time when trade was a good idea, when we liked jobs. Do you remember that age? Where we thought that actually having some income to pay people was a good thing. When the job of government was to make the country better off, not to trash the country. Do you remember those halcyon days when those things happened? Well, Joe, let's give him his due. He stands for all those things. He's a Financial Times journalist. He was a former uh, Japan editor of the FD. He un really does understand this business about international trade and all that. He's also got uh, the, the job which I had. He's Minister of State for Transport. Now, let's be clear. There are some things which are more important than Brexit. Much more. Uh, managing the trains is, is much more. But once we've stopped Brexit, what am I going to get? I'm going to become the, what they dubbed me last time when I was Secretary of Transport, the thin controller again. You're going to get the Northern Powerhouse, you're having HS2, you're having East West Rail, and all that, and I'm nagging Joe Johnson's job. But at the moment, what's the most important thing to do? It's to keep it simple. And what is the simple thing to do? People's vote, option to stop Brexit, campaign like that, no Brexit, end this nightmare. That is And, by the way, there are a few things we're going to do in the process. The BBC is going to become the BBC again. Not the Brexit, not the Brexit We are going to start welcoming migrants into this country again and end the xenophobia. We're going to respect Ireland and not trash Ireland, which is what's going on at the moment. Remember, remember do you know, I think some of the most monstrous things that are happening at the moment is British policy in respect of Ireland, as Jacob rees mogg tries to turn the clock back to somewhere in the Middle Ages, in terms of our relation with Ireland. Because remember what Jacob says is the answer. By the way, what I always ask the Brexiters now is, what is their answer to the Irish problem? Because... Um, what Michael was busy explaining to you is this big problem. You cannot have different customs and tariff arrangements and a different immigration policy, which is what the Brexiters are proposing, and not have a hard border. You have to have a hard border. You may be able to do it without having the actual physical infrastructure there and pretend it's not there and do it by having mobile searches and checks and stopping vehicles and all that, but you have to have a hard border. And of course, this is hugely toxic in Northern Ireland and could bring back the troubles, let's be clear because it will lead to smuggling, smuggling will be in the hands of the paramilitaries, which is why the Chief Counselor of the Peace Services of Northern Ireland has said that the biggest threat facing Northern Ireland at the moment is, Bre is Brexit, which is the reason why the Prime Minister is having to negotiate the backstop to the backstop and all that to try and deal with it. 
But so what I do when I'm with Brexiters, and by the way, I spent longer with Jacob and Nigel and, and Boris Johnson in, t in TV and radio debates on the members of my own family, and you can guess how much I enjoy doing that. <laughs> That's a big thing. But the question I've now started asking, there are two questions, I'll tell you what they are. The first question, actually there are three, let me give you all three. Okay. The first question I ask them is, what is your answer to the Irish problem? Because I've got an answer, and you've got an answer, no Brexit. That's the answer. How do you see there's no hard border? No Brexit. It's very simple. It's not complicated. Then you don't have different customs regimes. You don't have different tariff regimes. You don't have a different immigration policy. You don't have to have uh, all the, the infrastructure border you can carry on. Now, do you know what Jacob said was the answer? Jacob's answer to the Irish border question is, Ireland should also leave the European Union. <laughs> now, you've got to give it to him. This is coherent. <laughs> I mean, if they leave the European Union and they adopt our commercial policy and all of that, then you don't need to have a border. There is a slight problem. They don't want to leave the European Union. <laughs> and why should we think that the answer to the Irish problem is neo-colonialism? That, by the way, has got a bit of a history between England and Ireland. It wasn't great last time, and we shouldn't be returning there again. The second question I asked them, by the way, is how much do you think we should pay the EU in the exit deal? Because Theresa May member has said 50 billion. That is the deal which provisionally she's already agreed. Now this 50 billion is hugely important because this 50 billion gives the complete lie to the 350 million a week the NHS on the side of that bus. Do you remember the bus? Hey. Did, did the bus make it to Manchester or did you manage to keep it out? But that was the fun, that was the lie. Actually, there were two lies at the heart of Brexit. One lie was 350 million a week for the NHS. The other lie was the 7 million Turks. Do you remember the 7 million Turks were waiting to invade? You know, they were poised. The Daily Mail said they were coming the morning after the referendum. Uh, they haven't appeared yet, as it happens. We're still in the European Union now. There's still no uh, 7 million Turks. So there's these fundamental lies at the heart of it. However, the other question I asked the Brexiters is how much, if it's not Theresa May's 50 billion, how much are you going to pay? Now this is a good, and this goes to the heart of Brexit, because if they say it's nothing, then of course Brexit is impossible, because we're in default of our international treaty uh, obligations, uh, we, we don't have enough money to pay for all the, uh, the farmers and what they're owed, all the infrastructure projects, the regional development projects on the road, and the whole thing becomes literally completely dysfunctional. But they don't want to admit they're going to pay anything because that then gives the lie to the £350 million pounds, and means, of course, there has to be an agreement with the EU because if you're going to pay money, there has to be an agreement. So I keep asking them, how much will you pay? Nigel gets a bit irritated with me now, and so after the, fifth, uh, the 15th time of asking, he said to me, is it should be very little. And I said, well, Nigel, how little? £10 million? £20 billion? I mean, you know, you want it to be less than £50 billion. And he said, you know, Andrew, I think it should be a nice round number, zero. I said to him, Nigel, it cannot be zero. It's got to be a real figure because we have this issue of your pension. <laughs> Remember, Nigel's pension. So he's, been, he's, been, he's, a, he's a Eurocrat. He's been in the European Parliament. He doesn't turn up very often. And he he doesn't get performance pay. Maybe, maybe he wouldn't get a pension. But he is entitled to the £73,000 a year. And I said, Nigel, it's very important we pay your pension because I do not want you to be, in your old age, a burden on the state. <laughs> Very important that you're not. And I said there's another problem too, because the, uh, my other debate with him is why was he spies in the German embassy Europe filling out these big citizenship application forms? Because you know, I have spies everywhere. Madeleine and all these, they, they, they feed back to me. So he was seen in the German embassy filling out the forms. So for several encounters, I kept asking whether it was true that he'd applied for German citizenship for himself, because he has a German, German wife. And I said, I would exchange my seat in the House of Lords for his German passport. It's a fair deal. <laughs> anyway, he got very irritated. He would duck the questions, I knew there was something in it. And he told me in great exasperation afterwards that he was applying for citizenship for his kids. Now, this is very important. I said, this is wonderful. Nigel, it's wonderful you're applying for your children. I said, but there are many millions of other people in their 20s that would also like German passports. Why? Because they do not want their citizenship rights taken away from them. And if it's good enough for your children, it's good enough for all of the other young people in the country too. So, so I said to him, we have two big problems here. 
We've got to have an exit deal because we've at least got to pay £73,000 times as many years as you intend to live after the age of 65. He wants to come to the House of Lords, by the way, and that's significantly extend your life expectancy. So he could be with us another 40 or 50 years. So it's quite a large exit deal that we need. The other issue we have is this issue of citizenship, which is vitally important. Now, um, Madeleine and a lot of young people, and it's they have most at stake in Brexit, which is the reason why the young are overwhelmingly in favour of staying in the European Union. By the way, we should have votes for 16 and 17 year olds if we have our people vote next year. Exactly important. After he's all been here to fight for the joint possible, there's this group, your organisation, which some of you may be belong to, called Our Future, Our Choice which is the young, mobilising and young, which is fantastic. Now, one of these guys is really good at stunts. And the following morning, he turned up at Nigel's house with adoption papers. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what wants to be adopted by Nigel. And it, it, after why, if this, this is one way we have to be known. Needs must. We have a desperate situation. Remedies are needed. One way through this, this quad mile citizenship might be if Nigel adopts everybody in their 20s <laughs> in the so they can all get German passports. Well, actually, Nigel doesn't, doesn't like this idea at all. He became very angry with me in our last exchange. But I, I've now got a new gloss on this, which I did last time. I said, Nigel, I said, I know that you be, you're not keen to adopt many people in your friends, but I do need to have the answer to a question. What is the maximum age at which you will adopt people? I suppose there are lots of people who are much older. I have a 93-year-old who's very keen to be adopted by you because she also wants a German passport. Will you adopt her? Uh, uh, this is where our banter has got to uh, at the moment. But the crucial point underlying this, of course, is that citizenship rights are being taken away from people. And these citizenship, citizenship rights fundamentally affect people's right to work, to live, to travel, to forge relationships, to do all of those things which we've taken for granted and are one of the best things that's happened in Europe in the last 70 years. So what, are we, what do we want? We want a people's vote, option to remain, defend our citizenship, and just one thing I want to say, because we didn't hear enough about this two years ago in the referendum too, which is also a fundamental reason why we want to stay in the European Union. And do you know what it is? Peace. Yay! so many of us are wearing poppies is because, of course, we're celebrating the desperate centenary of the end of the First World War. Two world wars in the 20th century, and the European Union was created in the wake of the second so that it would never happen again. And do you know something? It has been phenomenally successful. There are only 70 years in the entire history of Europe when the peoples of Europe have been very largely at peace. And those 70 years are the 70 years where we were constructing and in the European Union. And why is that the case? Because the European Union is a club of democracies. There's never been 70 years when the major states of, the Euro of Europe have been democracies. And one of the conditions of them coming into the European Union is that they must be democracies and they must respect the boundaries of other European states. Now, at the moment in Europe, we have Putin, who has invaded one European state and half occupied it. Why? Because the Ukraine was about to join NATO and the European Union. He has troops massed on the borders of the Baltic states, with a real and present danger there. We have Mr. Salvini, who is the strong man in Italy, who has taken to tweeting Mussolini slogans on Mussolini's birthday this year. So you can see where that's going. You've got Orban in Hungary, who has abolished what goes for a free press, suspended judges, and is trying to abolish a university run by a Jew. You can see where that is going. The official opposition in Germany at the moment is the AFD, which has strong neo-Nazi elements in it. And the runner-up in the French presidential election two years ago was the National Front. Oh, and by the way, just the elections in Sweden, where the far-right party got 18%. Now, exam question. In this period of great instability with the rise of the far right, should Britain A, stay in the European Union and be at the heart of Europe, or B, leave Europe, become semi-detached, and complain when Europe falls prey to far right forces and the threat of massive instability caused by Russia? The fundamental point about this is that it's not just 
a nice to have Europe. It's not a nice to have alone, though it is nice to have more prosperity rather than less prosperity, trade that's free and all of that. It fundamentally defends our peace and our freedom. And if we take that for granted, which is what's now happening in this Brexit business, we will pay a very, very heavy price. And this week, the centenary of the end of the First World War, we should be very, very conscious of the price people have paid in the past and not subject the next generation to the possibility of having to pay a high price because we have played fast and loose with the peace and security of Europe. And this goes back to the very beginning of the European Union, because where does the European Union come from? It comes from the end of the Second World War, Winston Churchill's Zurich speech of 1946, where in the wake of the Berlin blockade and the Iron Curtain, he called for, and these were his words, a kind of United States of Europe, which is what led to the European coal and steel community being founded, and then the Treaty of Rome, the common market, the European Union as we have it now. And do you know something, because you haven't read this much in the Daily Mail and the Sun over the last 30 years, but the European Union has been a phenomenal success. It has been the best project for international peace, harmony and prosperity, probably in the history of civilization. We should be proud, we remember, we should be at the heart of it, we should have a people's vote, we should win the people's vote, and we should put this nightmare behind us. Thank you. much longer than everybody has got any questions for him. I mean, obviously, I read his book on class years ago. You know, you know, you know, what, about, what about Corbyn saying to Judas Spiegel, Brexit can't be stopped? I've never been so proud. Yeah, I, I, I mean, again, I'm on the left of the Labour Party, you know, and to me, Corbyn is in hell. I'm sorry. When I get people calling me a player, I can't abide it because I go, go, go and grow up where I grew up, then call me a player. But, but the reality is, what's happened to Labour? Why, why are they not opposing this? The overwhelming majority of Labour Party members, there'll be many here this evening, Labour Party members and Labour MPs are against Brexit and for people's votes. And the party's policy, agreed by our conference in, in um, Liverpool uh, six weeks ago, is also in favour of what the six tests, which include the exact same benefits of the single market and the customs union, which means voting against Theresa May's deal, and then we've said that we want an election. But if we don't get an election, then all options should be on the table, including a people's vote. So my own view is that by a process of elimination, we will get to a people's vote. That's what my own view of what will happen. However, it would be a good idea if Jeremy said it up front, rather than being forced into it by the collapse of Theresa May. So what I suggest we do, because we know it's people power here, is people should let Jeremy know what they think about his comments in Des Beagle. And you should let him know very bluntly <coughs> what you think on social media, by writing to him, by lobbying Labour MPs, so that we make absolutely sure that Labour does not commit a historic error, historic error, of allowing the far right, Nigel Farage, in league with the right wing of the Conservative Party, forcing a Brexit on us, which will destroy the prospects of working people across the United Kingdom. It does seem like the right wing rats are out the cage, you and then you quickly, yeah. Hello, uh, can I just address this question to Rolly Jones? You've spoken a lot about Sardinia and the resurgence of the right and throughout Europe. Uh, one of the uh, comments that I've heard recently about <coughs> Brexit is, is that if we don't give effect to the um, uh, referendum of 2016, that that in itself will give to a resurgence of the right in the UK. So how do we respond to that argument? It's, 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 look, let's be clear, as Churchill said of democracy, the situation we're in with a people's vote is the worst option except the alternatives. Because let's be clear what the alternatives are. The alternatives are to say that we're giving a veto to the far right when it comes to calling another referendum and allowing the people to express their considered view because they say that there will be serious instability if we hold a referendum. And do you know something? I'm not giving a veto in our democracy to Jacob Rees-Mogg, Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson. Any of you think that's a good idea? <laughs> no. So, 
the lesser evil is to hold a referendum. However, on the question about is it democratic or not, remember it was David Davis who told us a democracy which cannot change its mind is not a democracy. It's two and a half years now since the referendum in 2016. That is a longer interval than between the last two general elections. Yeah. And do you know who called the last general election early when she didn't need to? Because she wanted a further expression of the people's will, one Theresa May. So she can't have her cake and eat it in that respect either. But there's a fundamental reason why it's democratic too, which is was brought home to me in Belfast, where I've just been. In however bad we think Brexit is here, it's a, it's a hell of a lot worse, potentially, in Ireland because of this border issue, which is really, really worrying them, which is the reason why the latest polls are showing about 80% of them favour of staying in the EU. And uh, they want to defend the Good Friday Agreement, which is the peace, essentially the peace treaty, which would maintain the peace of Ireland. No hard border, power sharing between the nationalist and unionist communities, and very, very close working between the British and Irish governments, which I should say, by the way, is in jeopardy at the moment because of Brexit, which is pulling Britain and Ireland apart. Now, one of the people in the audience in Belfast said to me, when we had the Good Friday Agreement 20 years ago, and there was a referendum, a copy of the Good Friday Agreement, which is a long document, it's a 30-page, very technical document about the terms of decommissioning of weapons and things of this kind, was sent to every voter in Northern Ireland. Why? Because this was going to fundamentally affect their future, and their opinion was being sought in the referendum, and they read it. I mean, loads of people I've spoken to told me about, uh, about it, and, and, read it. And, and, this, and this person said to me, when Theresa May signs her deal, surely what we should do is send a copy to every voter across the United Kingdom, and let them express their view on it in a referendum, as we did here in Northern Ireland. The option, the only credible option facing the country should be between that deal or staying in the EU. We know what staying in the EU is because we're in it at the moment. Now, this is, gives you the complete answer to the reason why we need a referendum. Two years ago, you could not send that document to the British people because it didn't exist. There was no set of terms for what Brexit should be. There was no answer to what's going to happen to the Irish border, our payments to the EU, the rights of EU residents in Britain and British residents on the European continent, what was going to happen to the customs union, the single market, free movement of people, all these crucial issues. There was no policy because it hadn't been negotiated. The first time the British people will know where that policy is, is in a month or two months' time, when Theresa May negotiates the treaty. So what should happen is very simple. A copy should be sent to every voter, and that is the reason why we need a people's vote. It's the first time people would have seen it. We're a democracy. This is the biggest issue that's going to affect the British people in our generation. They should get a copy. They're perfectly capable of reading it and making sense of it, and then they should give their view in a people's vote. There's not really time uh, for any more questions for Andrew, but we've got to say, Andrew, and I love your books as well, the platform's fantastic, because, uh, you know, it's fantastic. and the BBC stuff, worked for them for years, couldn't, couldn't believe it when I was listening to uh, the Today programme the other day, when they were trying to balance the IFS and their findings on Brexit with somebody from the Taxpayers' Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> they just thought, like, the IFS don't represent their number crunches. You know, you don't say your numbers are wrong. So, Andrew, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, today. And, uh, you know, keep, keep up the fight. We can definitely win this. The only thing that's stopping us winning it is a lack of confidence in ourselves in our capacity to win it. 700,000 people on the streets of London three weeks ago. Every constituency with a big, big pro-European movement which is taking root. With brilliant campaigners like your speakers this evening who, who, who are out there too. Joe Johnson's resignation today is very, very significant because what's essentially happening is that the government is starting to implode. And sensible, sensible level-headed Tories know that this is the wrong thing to do and that this is history type stuff. If we keep pushing now, I am convinced we can win it. We're in the end game, we're in the no, final 100 yards, we should really, really go for it. That means writing to your MP, doing social media, getting out in demonstrations, 
and, can, and seeking to persuade and work with all your, all your friends too. If we do all those things, I'm convinced we can win it. And that is then only the beginning. Because part of the reason we're in this mess, let's be clear, is because governments didn't do enough to sort out the problems we've got at home, particularly in the Midlands and the north of this country. There is too much poverty, too much division, too much inequality, too much austerity. We need to tackle all of those issues with a new passion, but we will not be able to tackle any of them if we're having an existential argument about our place in the world, our basic security alliances, and the rules of our trade. So what should our message be? Remain plus. Remain but not as an end in itself, but as the basis for doing what should have been done in this country over the last generation, which is really sorting out our social crisis, a fair and much better deal for working people in this country, and then we look back on this period as a nightmare, a car crash avoided, and the basis which we started really sorting out the big fundamental problems which British people are expecting to be sorted out, and it's part of the reason why they voted as they did two years ago. So we can do it, we've just got to have real passion, real commitment, and just absolutely go for it. Thanks very much. Thank you.